Um, if you haven't already, please put yourself on mute um, until the Q&A portion at, and at the end, and then uh, everyone can, can ask their questions. And then anyone but the panelists, um, you can turn your video camera off as well. Um, so I wanted to, uh, I'll introduce myself again. I'm here with my colleague, Eric Turiel, as he just mentioned. Um, and I'm Jenny Kurzweil. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing with SAFNIS. Uh, to get us started, I wanted to provide just a little bit of information um, on California AB 1887, just to make sure that everyone else is on, on the same page as we get started. Um, so California issued a travel ban for all state employees, officers, or members so including the UC, CSUs, and community colleges, uh, to refrain from using public funds to travel to seven states, including Texas. Uh, the ban was issued as a response to um, a sincerely held religious belief law that was passed in Texas that would prevent LGBT parents from adopting or fostering children. Um, AB 1887 may affect students, staff, and faculty from California state-funded colleges and universities who wish to attend 2018 softness using school uh, or California-based funding. But there are several exceptions to this ban, primarily the clause that the fact that the, the law does not apply to travel that is required to participate in meetings or trainings required by a grant or to maintain funding. It also does not apply to travel funded by federal grants or private money and it does not impact private institutions or prohibit California students from applying for softness sponsored travel scholarships. So that's the background on AB 1887, but people are asking us why softness chose to stay in Texas. And it actually, <clears throat> our decision around staying in Texas happened around the same time that AB 1887 was passed but it actually, our decision had nothing to do with AB 1887. It actually had to do with the passage of a bill called SB 4, which was passed by the Texas legislation. And it's an anti-sanctuary cities bill. So essentially it is, um, it's a bill that uh, does a major crackdown on the relationship between law enforcement and immigration. Um, and it was, wildly wildly contested and has actually now stalemated in the uh, Texas Supreme Court and it has not been enacted. But while the, the massive protests were happening against it, the Softness Board of Directors decided to stand in solidarity with Texas and those who opposed the bill. Um, Texas has the second largest Hispanic population in the United States and it also houses 10% of our 115 Sockness chapters. Um, and lastly, the 2018 Sockness contracts were signed over five years ago, and breaking the contract was cost prohibitive. So um, those, those were the reasons that, that we decided to stay. Notwithstanding, the California travel ban does provide difficulty for us, but we really wanted to ensure that the thousands of Texan STEM students have the accessibility uh, to attend softness, particularly if there were draconian um, uh, anti-immigration laws on the books, which would make it difficult for them to travel out of state. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Mark Lawson. Uh, Mark, you wanna, you wanna unmute yourself so you can say hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I just try to keep the background down. But, uh, uh, hopefully, I'll have some good information for you uh, at this meeting. So I'm glad to be joining it. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, the faculty director of postdoctoral training and education here at UCSD. And I also direct the UC President's postdoctoral fellowship program. But a lot of my background is in undergraduate mentoring and outreach. Uh, and I've had training programs uh, through professional societies and other uh, activities that have really engaged in uh, STEM diversity issues. Um, currently, I'm co-directing an IMSD program here on campus. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience in dealing with these issues. Um, and through my interactions at OP, 
at the office of the president, I have hopefully a little bit of insight on how to manage these things because they're uh, causing trouble up and down the uh, institution as to what the interpretations of these uh, of these guidelines um, are, and laws are. So hopefully uh, we'll get to some questions. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, our next panelist is April. Okay. So, um, and in the graduate division, I work closely with Mark Lawson and in, um, you know, scheduling our outreach trips and coordinating the campus presence at uh, large events such as Sockness and a couple of others that happen every year. So, um, I'm just happy to be here and I hope that I can share some information that will be helpful. Great. Thank you, April. And our last panelist. Our second to last panelist is Chris Murphy. Chris, can you take a moment to introduce yourself, please? Sure, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, my name is Chris Murphy. I am um, not actually an employee for the University of California, but my heart is near and dear there. Uh, prior to me being at the California State University Office of the Chancellor, uh, I was working with Mark and April uh, with the Diversity Outreach Recruitment and Retention at UC San Diego. Uh, in my new role here as the uh, Chancellor's Office in the California State University, um, I'm hoping that I can contribute to the conversation on how to best go about uh, making this trip happen for those of our California students who really want to be at Stockton this year. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. And our next Hello, I'm Eric Correa. I'm a program associate here at SACNIS, um, and I manage our travel scholarship program here. Um, so I'm definitely available here for any questions that any um, any participant may have as far as how this um, legislation impacts potential travel scholarship applicants. Great. So thanks, everybody. Um, so we have, uh, you know, a few minutes of, of advice and strategies that our panelists have already thought about. Um, and so we'll go through those. We'll, we'll talk about uh, students, then faculty program, uh, faculty and program directors, and then exhibitors. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions. So for our first uh, bit is students and, and any one of our panels, please just join in and, and have a conversation about what your ideas are. So uh, first off, uh, you know, at least at, in the University of California, there's some advantage in that uh, a lot of students are working in labs uh, that are funded through programs like IMSD or, uh, or some other related program. Some of my you know, graduate students, postdocs, which we also send are often funded on T32 grants. Um, and so there's there's access to federal funding that will that will help them. But in addition to that, uh, because that resources can be that resource can be uh, thinned out a bit if there's a lot of demand on it for a, for a session like this, is to to approach uh, chairs and deans for basically uh, uh, money that are, is not directly derived from state funds. So often. Um, particularly in R1s and things, um, people will have the access uh, to uh, non-state funds, strategic funds, they're often called opportunity funds, um, that are derived through grant overhead expenses or other things and they're not dependent on the state funding stream and therefore can be used to at least partially support students if there's a limited uh, uh, resource available. Um, and really the only way to do that uh, and justify it as a return on investment is to make sure that those uh, students that are attending are, you know, applying to, to present their work. It's usually the, the, the justification of presenting your work that allows these monies to be, um, to be distributed uh, for, the, for the travel use uh, and because it's part of presenting the research. Um, having a student attend without presenting work is a little more challenging and strict you know federal funds or something should be reserved for those if that's necessary and then and then try to get the other ones uh, supported in non non state funded uh, opportunity funds so I think that basically covers that those two points right there okay well I can jump in uh, Great. I I've been thinking a lot about this even over the last year as this was coming up and my recommendation for students and support staff 
is to be creative with how these monies are going to be used. Uh, we know that based on the, the actual text on the policy that it, it travel to the state, that, that's the problem. So obviously flight is a big deal. Obviously hotel and food in the state of question is a big deal. Uh, but those two costs are covered by the travel fellowship. And that's the key. That's the key deal here. I think that for California students, really centering the strategy around how to support themselves at the conference is going to be key on working with a travel scholarship. That does lead to other expenses. Uh, registration is a big one. Uh, travel to and from the airport is a big one as well. And, uh, and so what I would suggest is for you as a student to talk to your mentor, talk to anyone who, who deals with the money on your campus and find out just how they're interpreting that law, how are they interpreting that rule? Because whenever you pay the registration fee, it's going to Stockness, not to Texas. So if there is money available to cover that huge expense, several hundred dollars here, and uh, they are fluid with their interpretation of that rule, since it's not travel to, it's the cost of the cost of registering for the conference, then that would uh, that would really bring down the, the budget on how much more that you need to personally fundraise in order to make this happen. Those are great points, Chris. Thank you. I'm going to move on to um, faculty and program directors. Um, does any, any one of our panelists want to jump in to that? This this one should be a lot easier for the uh, to to work with. This is Mark, by the way. If you if you can't see a screen, um, uh, this one should be easier to deal with because often um, uh, faculty and program directors can travel off their own uh, federal or unrestricted funds, um, and or if they're program directors, they're actually obligated under these grants to be attending these meetings. You know, they've written them into the grant. So, you know, kind of alongside the thing that that Chris has brought up and would apply also to the students would be that, you know, if the proposal, for instance, you know, the IMSD grant or, or any other related type grant, um, aside from being a federal program, um, if it is commingled with state dollars, um, generally attendance at a meeting like SOCNAS uh, and, the, and the related meetings and other disciplines is often written into and then an obligated part of that proposal. Uh, and so that can provide some of the uh, uh, exceptional uh, conditions that would allow uh, the use of travel. Um, and uh, and so, those, uh, th th so some of the solutions are essentially the same, but I, I think some of it has to do with how, how these programs are written, you know, whether, you know, the participation in these activities is actually required as a PI if you've said that you're going to be doing that. And so... Um, so I, I think in essence, the burden is a little bit smaller on the faculty and or program directors than it is with trying to get students and participants in there. Chris or April, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think for, for me, I think both Chris and, and Mark um, covered it. And then also I noticed today that the Travel award applications just opened for Sockness, right? Yes, that's correct. Right. So, what going back to what Chris said is, you know, really, you know, being aggressive and applying for those travel grants so that you can at least get some of the travel piece covered, and then handle the registration. You know, figure out the registration later. But that's you know that that's about half the cost right there. That you know the travel and the hotel. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about um, exhibitors because exhibitors don't have those federal grants that they're working with. And I know that the UCs have a very strong presence in our exhibit hall. So I'd love to hear some ideas and strategies that you might have around that. Well, from San Diego, we ha we're fortunate to have a source of funding that is not uh, that are not state funds. So it's, it, that's been very helpful. So I don't know if there are opportunities 
for campuses to, uh, you know, explore to see if there are other, you know, funding sources on campus that they might be able to use that are not directly state funds. Well, we'll head into the, um, the Q&A portion in a moment, but Mark, you had said something in our prep call around um, the fact that uh, the, the sale of the exhibition booth goes directly to Stockness, and the exhibit company is in, based out of a different state, so the Shepherd, the exhibiting company. Um, so it, did you have any more thoughts about that or how you have been looking at, at, at strategizing around where the actual money goes to? Right. Uh, you know, and I think Chris uh, mentioned this too. This is what sort of inspired that line of thinking, I think, was, um, uh, is, you know, uh, you know, is the fact that you know, the sponsorship itself is a commercial ex uh, transaction between uh, Sognos, which is based in California, and a California state uh, institution, which is based in California. Um, and so it's not doing business uh, travel or whatever um, to to and from that state. It's doing business with Sacnas, you know. And POs are. I think we discussed the, uh, the you know the the uh, the fact that the you know POs are built out of of either the um, the exhibitor services or Sacnas directly. And then so those things I think actually would not be impacted by that uh, by that ruling because really it is. Uh, restricted to the travel aspects. What about sending the actual exhibitors there? Can you have creative ideas around maybe utilizing students and faculty in the exhibit hall so you minimize the amount and then maybe one of the professional recruiters or because of because the recruiters are going to that staff the hall are yeah. going to have to go. So, well, well, as Chris knows, we're not professionals since he's left. So <laughs> we're all we're all rookies. So, um, but, you know, we we mainly rely on uh, our graduate students and postdocs as representatives of the institution. Uh, and there's reasons why we do that, and that's mainly because those are the people that are having the real experience and can provide the most honest input. Uh, into the into the um, you know into the environment that that we're trying to recruit to, um, there are a few uh, uh, program staff uh, that attend, um, and that they're the ones that may have to be more 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 careful. So, for instance, we'll have uh, the coordinators, the staff coordinators for different graduate programs, um, attend. But uh, but what happens is that generally, uh, at least on our campus, is um, happening through the individual programs and identifying their own funds, which is what we addressed earlier. And so that hasn't become, or we don't anticipate that being an issue. Uh, they may reduce the numbers of staff that go, um, but, uh, um, but because we rely heavily on the student and postdoc presence, you know, in, in essence, they get travel grants to go if they m spend part of their time manning the booth um, is kind of how we, we bait and switch them for that is, um, and that seems to be, that seems to be a, a very effective model. That's great. Thank you. Um, we'll move to the, the question and answer portion of this. And I want to let you know that this call is being recorded so that we can share this conversation on our website um, afterwards for people that weren't able to make it. So if you do want to ask your question, please unmute, unmute your microphone. And then if you're willing, state your name and your institutional affiliation. But again, that's if you're willing because this is being recorded. Then uh, direct your question to a specific panelist. It's applicable and we are open for business. So there's a there's a chat question from uh, from Jorge uh, Will, who I think is is he still yeah he's still here on the um, here on the call. So Jorge had had chatted out the question: Where does your other funding source come from, and does it exist at other UC campuses? So the other funding sources are generally things that can be called under different names like opportunity funds. 
Uh, they can also be called, um, uh, they can be private donor funds from the from uh, fundraising sources, you know, alumni association. Uh, our, our physics program traditionally uses money from physics alumni to send their students. And so, uh, and so there, there, there's various places where these sources can come from. Grant overhead expenses uh, generally will not have a direct line to a state fund. In fact, if you ever have a question about it, you can ask the business office if their state funds are not, because they'll be able to tell by the by the um, the accounting code on the funds that they use. So they'll know how to do that. That's sort of back office type stuff. Um, but almost every campus will have some source of of um, uh, other other income uh, uh, that they'll have access to. And they're often called strategic or opportunity funds. And those are kind of the keywords you would use when you're asking about that. So hopefully that answered uh, Jorge's question. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, and, uh, and to remind you that travel applications, travel scholarship applications, and as Mark said, um, the, the student presentation applications open today. And um, as Mark, as Mark mentioned, we see one more question just came in. As Mark mentioned, um, to encourage the success of funding rates uh, for these students, having them be presenters is also a, a, an added benefit. So make sure that your students are applying for both. Um, and Vanessa sent a question in. Um, as far as students go, the number one thing to do is complete the travel scholarship. Yeah, so this is Eric here at SACNIS again. Um, I just want to highlight that our applications did open for travel scholarship uh, today. Um, they will be available until I April 13th um, to apply. And what they cover is they cover the round trip flight uh, to San Antonio and the lodging part um, of the conference. And the key thing this year is that our travel scholarships are available to all STEM students. Um, so as Chris brought up earlier during the during this call, I think that's really key to know is that SACNIS could potentially cover those costs if you are awarded a travel scholarship. Um, so the only thing you would be responsible for as the applicant is getting the registration funds covered. Um, and I think Chris brought up a really good um, angle that you could potentially use uh, funds on your campus to potentially get that covered. Great. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we'll wrap up. Um, you can always reach out to any one of us um, on the email on your screen, uh, which is info at sockness.org. And, uh, and then also, of course, on the website, call us, anything, we're available. Um, as you can tell through this webinar, we really want to make it uh, easier for Californians to participate. Um, we are deeply committed to our California SACNISAs, as you can tell, uh, because we're based in California as well. Um, and uh, and uh, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much to our panelists, Mark, April, and Chris. So if you have colleagues or friends at those other institutions and you found this webinar helpful, please forward them the information. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.